everybody. Welcome to Central Baptist Church. I'm so glad to see every one of you out, and uh, thank you for coming. All right, we have a wonderful song that the choir is going to sing to us, and hopefully you're going to enjoy it, and, and it will be a blessing to you and those that are watching on Facebook. And uh, if y'all would, just please enjoy. We're going to sing The Old Country Church, and thank you again for coming. He's heading out Wednesday to go to, to uh, North Carolina to be doing some tent meetings down there. He's an evangelist, so you pray for their meetings. Okay, welcome to the service. Again, special time. After the service, we want to ask you to stick around. Stay with us. We have a bunch of food that's been brought in. We, uh, love to have you stay with us. The rooms are all spaced out. They're different. I'm trying to do some social distancing and things. You'll be served with folks who have the gloves and so forth and the masks on. So, uh, but it'll be a time of fellowship and a time of friendship, okay? Uh, come grow with us is a theme today, okay? All right. All righty, so everyone go ahead and stand up, and we're going to open up your songbooks, and we're going to have a... 
a chorus. Praise Him. 445. That's what we're trying to do. We're getting closer to God, so we are going to sing Praise Him. Y'all join me on this first chord, on the first verse, okay? Here we go. Because you're still saved. I hope you're saved. If you're not saved, we invite you to do that today, this morning, before you even go home. The greatest choice that you can ever make. All right, let's go ahead and sing that last verse. Thank you. Zachary, our dog Bandit. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want a dog named Bandit, but you know, that's okay. All right, preacher, what do you think for Eternal life and the privilege to serve. Praise God for that. Yes, sir. Mr. Nate, for food. Yep. I think you've probably been eyeing some of that food back there this morning, okay? Miss Mary. The Word of God, the Bible, yes, okay, yes, Corbin, Chick-fil-A, okay, Chick-fil-A, got to get Chick-fil-A in there somewhere, Joshua, well, thank you, buddy, thank you, praise the Lord for that, Melissa, a friend's, yes, what's your friend's first name, Melissa, Doris, thank you, glad you're here, you have something you want to praise the Lord about, sure. Wonderful. Amen. Yes. Praise God for that. So good. Nathaniel, did you have your hand up? Love and forgiveness. Amen. Crystal, we got the dogs in here today. We got Bandit and Marvelous. A dog named Marvelous. Okay, good. Wonderful. Miss Jenny, the cross of Christ. Yes, praise God for the cross of Christ. Anyone else? I don't want to miss anybody. Yes, sir. Luke. Chocolate. Okay, the kids are on. The kids want to eat. They want to skip the service. Yes, it goes directly to the food, right? So they didn't have breakfast. Yes. Okay. Amen. This is the day the Lord hath made. Say it with me. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now let's say it again. But when you get the word glad, I want you to smile. Okay. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let, Let us, us rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, all right. Let's do that last verse again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here we go. We didn't thank him enough, so we're going to thank him one more time. Here we go. Thank him. Thank him. be 
seated. Take your bulletin out there. We got several announcements. We're going to try to go through them very, very quickly. Once everyone, uh, before we get into the bulletin, look up here at me, if you would. Um, we had the privilege to go to a prayer retreat, or I like to call it a prayer advance, over at the Edge Christian Camp across the river. Dr. Brother Tom Albus, a pastor on the other side of Richmond, did it. Excellent job. Uh, he brought out something, and I came back with this, and maybe I'm being a little selfish this morning, um, but it's how to pray for a pastor. These are laying on there, and I would, I'd like to humbly ask of you to take one of those, and would you, not just myself, Brother Daniel's on pastoral staff, uh, and also Amy, of course, is you know, a preacher, but she's on our secretary, and Miss Hall's our bookkeeper. Would you pray for the staff? And pray for Preacher Jordan, definitely, as he goes. Pastor, you pastored for over 25 years. I think you told me, and you've been evangelist for, what, over 30 years, haven't you? 20 years. 20 years. Okay, so at least about 50 years in combination there. Praise God. 88 years of age. How are you doing today? Best day yet. Best day yet. Amen. <laughs> you can't stop a guy like that. Getting ready to go to North Carolina and have a part in preaching, and he's taking a tent down there. Three meetings already scheduled and two more possibly to come. So pray for that. He's our Caleb. Caleb was 85 years old and said, I want that mountain, right? And that's what we, we went to the uh, senior conference day yesterday at the, at the camp. They had 81 seniors there. Amen. It was a great day. And Brother Brent Rochester and his family sang, played instruments. And he preached, and he preached on Caleb. All right, you're going to think I'm crazy. You already know I am. I didn't have anything to write on. But sometimes as a preacher, you like to get an outline. There was a napkin in the pack that they gave us. And I wrote it down. His points were Caleb had character. Caleb had confidence in the Lord. And Caleb had courage. And the other three main things was Caleb faced, he faced grasshoppers. You remember that? He faced giants. You know, are they too big to hit or too big to miss? Think about that one. And he also faced gray hair, won't stop me. <laughs> he was 85 years young. Amen. He said, I want that mountain, Joshua. And he went and got it. There is also, I'm kind of hitting these here, it's not in the bulletin. These brochures are out on that same table. It's called Sweet Hour of Prayer. Again, learning about it at the prayer advance. Um, a lot of questions in here to help you when you go before the Lord, and it will be convicting, I guarantee you. Questions like, is God first in my plans? Am I willing to pay the price for personal revival? Am I impatient? Am I irritable? Uh, do my hurt feelings keep me from serving God? Do I swell up five, if you would, to come and help us with that? Um, keep passing those tracks out. Daniel, do you have a total you're going to give us or anything near there? Uh, we're going to have to count it up and give it in uh, okay. the evening. All right, we'll give it in the evening service, the total of how many tracks. If there is now a sheet in the foyer, you can put how many tracks you're giving out. Okay, and we have a little, little contest going. You get a Soul Winner's New Testament, and there's a really neat book booklet they're going to give out, too. And the young people get a different gift, right? They get a different thing they're working for. Um, homeschool days, our homeschool next, next meeting is this Friday. Um, if you have a homeschool, you like to come, be it. It's a time where all the homeschoolers in the church get together. They eat and so forth, and, and I think they're learning. Brian's teaching them Hebrew or Greek? Greek, Greek to young people. And they're picking up on it and doing a bang-up job with it. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, let's see here. Sunday, next Sunday, uh, Jackie and Brian's house, the ladies are meeting with a ladies' tea. It's always a great time. I know when the ladies get to go over there. Uh, Jackie and Brian always do a great job with it. Missions conference is coming around the corner. You see our flags. These are now going to stay in here permanently. Central supports about 75 missionaries. We're going to May the 2nd. On that Wednesday night, we're going to have a meal for you. You don't have to cook. Just come, eat, and go right into the service, okay? So it should be a special time together, and we'll do some other special things in relation to the conference. 
We have one guy, one of our missionaries in Africa, is going to, we're going to Skype him in or whatever we're going to do, and you'll be able to see him. Uh, and he'll tell about his, the ministry there. Um, I, think, uh, I think that's about it. Back of the brochure. I had Amy put something uh, on the back of the brochure. It's kind of a little funny, but it's, but it's kind of along the lines. I'm going to be preaching on the three gardens in the Bible this morning. Uh, dealing with our and I guess it is getting near that time to do that as you plant may I suggest the following rules for your garden planting plant three rows of squash number one squash gossip number two squash criticism squash indifference plant three rows of peas purity patience perseverance plant six rows of lettuce let us be unselfish and loyal. Let us be faithful to duty. Let us search the scriptures. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Let us be obedient in all things. Let us love one another. No garden is complete without turnips. Uh-oh, I never did like turnips, but anyway. Turn up for church, prayer service, and Bible study. Turn up with a smile, even when things are difficult. Turn up with determination. Planned on doing that. Um, guys, why don't we do this? I'm going to change this up a little bit on you. Dave, Rick, why don't you guys come on down? Jerry? Robert, let's do the offering right now, since we're talking about giving. The Bible talks about, in Proverbs chapter 5, it says, or Proverbs chapter 3, some of you, this is your favorite life's verse. 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, or know him. And he shall direct thy paths. That's where we get into trouble, directing our own paths. And some of that is even in our giving. Be not wise. Look at the context of what this verse is written in. Verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. And then it says, verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Uh, people ask me sometimes, what about tithing in the Bible? It's there, and our folks tithe. It's giving a 10% of what we make in our gross income, and as we do so, God honors that, and God turns back and always blesses us because of it, you know? All thine increase. All thine increase. Amen? Okay. Um, Brother Jerry. He's wearing cowboy boots today. We praise the Lord for that. It beats the flip-flops. <laughs> Amen. That's, yeah, right. Okay, would you, would you lead us, brother? Dear precious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for such a blessed and beautiful day. Yes. Lord, we can come together and be a church family. Lord, you can invite others into our church family, Lord, and express our love to them, not knowing them just as Christ one day not, did not know us. Lord, we're so thankful. Yes. Amen. Lord, as we continue to move forward, we just ask that you would bless the effort of this offering that you would have to further your kingdom. Lord, just multiply it as you do all other things. So bless this time, bless this time, bless this offering we pray. In Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
For those of y'all that thought that was Amy playing, that wasn't. All right. That was Isabel playing, and she's really coming into her own as a piano player. And I'm thankful to God for that. So this gave Amy a break, too. So. All right, let's uh, look at your memory verse. Uh, it's in the bulletin. Acts 2, verse 47 will get your opportunity to quote this verse on next Sunday night. That's our last Sunday in March. And we want you to be able to uh, say this, and we'll get you a little reward. Have the kids run around, give you some candy if you can quote this verse. So Acts 2.47, go ahead and say it with me. Praising God and having favor with all the people. All right, now that we've said it, we're going to sing it because singing it is going to be better to get it into your mind, okay? Do you know the music for it? That's okay. <laughs> all right, well, if you've already heard the song, go ahead and just sing it with me. If not, then pretend. You'll learn it. It's, all right. it's not a hard song. It goes like this. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. All right, do it one more time, okay? Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. All right, I'm not going to dock any points if you have to sing the verse next Sunday night to quote it to get some candy, okay? As long as you remember it, that'd be great. Now, if y'all would take your songbooks and open them up and stand with me, we'll sing one more song before we let the ladies come and sing. And this is number 587 at Calvary, number 587. If you didn't know, that's where we're supposed to start pointing people, if you haven't done so already. And speaking of that, the tracks that we've been handing out, I'm not going to take track totals here this morning. There is a piece of paper underneath the TV in the foyer. If you have given out tracks and you would like to record those for our corporate track giving out numbers, go ahead and put your name and the number of tracks given out for this week. All right, that's from the 15th to the 21st. Put them on that sheet of paper out there right underneath the TV, and we'd love to add up our track numbers and see how far we get in, in the month for our track month. All right, number 587 at Calvary. that he showed that even invited you to come to him so we're going to sing about that love that even allowed you to get saved that gave you the choice to say hey let me accept god or not if you haven't done so i would love for you to come to the saving knowledge of jesus christ this morning let's sing that fourth verse with me right now okay
given us the spirit of fear, but has given us the strength to Yesterday we were over at the camp with the senior dinner and so forth and had a great time. And one of the comments was made close to what Ms. Hall, our previous pastor's wife, and she's in the back working with the young people this morning. Uh, she says to me from time to time, where is she? Is she not here? Is she in the back? Ms. Hall, you slipped in on me. Yeah, because I saw Jenny by herself. I didn't see you with her. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyway, she says to me from time to time, she's, she's served here at Central over 50 years. Came here as a young person when Central had a Bible college, uh, talking about a regular, blown, full-blown Bible college, and uh, she graduated, and uh, she actually got saved here while she was in Bible college, and uh, later on, of course, married Pastor Hall and, um, and served uh, in the church and the Christian school that they had, and just a faithful, faithful servant of the Lord. Um, and one of the statements she makes to me from time to time, Preacher, I just want to finish well. And that's kind of what they reiterated yesterday at the camp. 
Now, most of those people sitting there were older than I was. <laughs> Sandra. Sandra lives in Richmond now. It's good to see her. She's down here with us. Amen. Yeah, they were older than I was, you know, but that's okay. I learned much from them. We had a great time in the Lord. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3 there in the Bible, okay? Genesis chapter 3. Talking about the gardens, those of you who are visiting with us today, we have a really nice gift for you. I don't know if the guys have already gotten it to you or not, but it's a, um, I've got in my hand up here a little, a little planter box. Uh, actually has a little bag in it, got the peat moss or stuff in there, and got the seeds. The seeds are, for, are forget-me-nots, I think, right, Daniel? has a little logo on there so you won't forget us, and hope you'll come back again. Um, if you didn't get one, so get one as you go out today. I'm preaching on the three gardens, the three gardens found in the Bible. I just want to start with I will a few more extra illustrations today than I normally give, okay? So bear with me. Um, little Nancy was in the garden, and she was filling in a hole when her neighbor peered over the fence and interested in what the little girl was up to. He politely asked these, this question. What are you up to, Nancy? My goldfish died with a tear in her eye, and I've just buried him. And the neighbor seemed concerned, you know. That's an awfully big hole for a goldfish to be buried in, isn't it? She patted down the last heap of earth and then replied, That's because he's inside your stupid cat. <laughs> All right, enough foolishness, right? Okay, think about it a while. Those of you are cat lovers, forgive me. Okay. All right. Let's look at uh, Genesis chapter number 2, and we'll get to chapter 3. We're talking about the gardens in the Bible. You know, the Bible mentions several gardens. Sometimes it'll mention vineyards. And to the Jews especially, gardens, vineyards, that was, very, that was a money-making way to, for the family. And also, it was a beautiful thing. I don't know how many of you ever visited the Outer Banks of North Carolina down on Roanoke Island, where I pastored on the north end at Roanoke Island Baptist Church. Just a mile past the church on the right was uh, the Lost Colony drama, the 2,000-seat amphitheater outside. And folks would come and see that during the summer. It was always an exciting time. But a little bit past the drama, a lot of folks didn't know about it, it's still there, are the Elizabethan Gardens. If you go through them, they are gorgeous. They are beautiful, especially during April and May when things are blooming. Um, picture going down Airport Road, going towards the little airport on the island, and the fruitless pear trees blooming all the way down. Just a beautiful sight to see. And many times here, our folks here, and I grew up in Chesapeake, our folks here like to go to places like the Norfolk Botanical Gardens, you know. Another wonderful place. Um, I like the light shows, I like the Christmas light shows at the Newport News Park or the Botanical Gardens or, or even the beach water, Virginia Beach waterfront. You ride down the Virginia Beach waterfront and you got lights coming off the ocean and, and then on this side of the ocean coming over you and all that, it's gorgeous. Um, we have a man in our church, he's, he's home, uh, not well physically, Sandy's husband, and uh, Rupert worked for Newport News Parks and all for many years. And those lights that you see are lit up there in the New Produce Park for Christmas. A lot of that he used to have to put up and take down and all that kind of good stuff. So what does a garden depict? A garden depicts beauty. I don't know. How many of you, how many of you have a, a, a flower garden back home? Okay. A few of you? What's that? See? I have a jungle in my house. You have a jungle in your house. Okay. A flower garden in the house inside. All right, how many of you have uh, maybe a vegetable garden you're planning to plant one this year? Oh, wow. Okay, wonderful. Remember the preacher and his family when you, when you uh, have the fruits come in. Okay, I love ice-cold tomatoes on mayonnaise and bread. Mmm, salt and pepper, nothing like it. Amen. Same stuff the Lord dropped to the children of Israel in the wilderness with that Chick-fil-A. Amen. Okay. But a garden predicts, uh, shows beauty, and the Garden of Eden was Nonetheless, probably the most beautiful garden. Isn't it interesting that God starts with a garden? Who planted the garden? God did. 
Do you think it was a beautiful garden before the fall? Yes, it was. It was the most beautiful garden that ever has been. Uh, they pick, it depicts a thing of beauty because it shows the God who made it. It shows the loving designer behind the beauty of the garden. Some of you go over to Colonial Williamsburg, you go behind the governor's palace, and they've got the maze of the bushes, you know. You have to walk through those bushes and try to find your way through. There are all types of gardens, but I would like to have seen the Garden of Eden because it showed the beauty of the greatest creator, of course, there ever is and ever will be. But it also shows the bounty of the garden. Uh, we have some folks who are watching this morning, Brother Cliff and Sister Joyce, and last couple years, Brother Cliff hasn't physically been able to do a garden, but when he does one, it's just beautiful, fantastic, and he'll bring a few things to me. Uh, there again, you learn from the example of that, right? And bring some stuff to the preacher. Preacher, you'd like some Crowder peas out of that, wouldn't you? He loves Crowder peas, okay. Um, the garden is beautiful, but it also review, reveals God's bounty. Not just beauty, but God's bounty. Don't you love it when the stuff, the stuff co starts coming in from the vegetable garden? Yeah. And you start to enjoy it, and you're really having a, a wonderful time you're reaping the fruits of it all. Some of you might have fruit trees in your yard. Anybody have fruit trees in their yard? Just a few? Okay, good. So you got me to have a fruit tree. But it shows the beauty and the bounty that God provides for us. Look at uh, chapter 2 and verse number 8. Chapter 2 and verse number 8, this is before we get to the fall of man, when Adam and Eve sinned against God. But they would walk with God in the cool of the garden, in the cool of the day. So the garden was not just a place of beauty, not just a place of bounty, but it was a place of fellowship. And it signified how beautiful it is. You know, it makes me think so much of the song that we sing sometimes, I come to the garden alone, or the song in the garden. You're going to learn a few things this morning as we go along here. God is interested in gardens. Okay? Look at verse number 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree <clears throat> that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. After creation, God planted this wonderful, beautiful garden. And it was a garden of beauty. It was a garden of bounty and a garden of fellowship. And the garden became home for who? Adam and Eve. By the way, side note, not Adam and Steve. Right? Adam and Eve. God created man and he created woman. And there's a garden of beauty. And as God did so, he supplied all their needs. Their needs were supplied from the garden. The beautiful garden. The bountiful garden. The fellowship time garden. God supplied everything through that garden for Adam and Eve. God met them in the garden for fellowship. But there was one restriction. What is the restriction? You know that? Verse number 3 of chapter 3. Jump over there. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve is quoting there again, to Satan. Can't touch that one. Disobedience, though. Eve did so. Adam ate, partook also. And plunged the whole human race into a fallen state. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. That's why we have graveyards. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. Every person ever born has a sinful nature. Isn't it amazing? Even with the little children, you have to say no more than you have to say yes. We have a stubborn, prideful, rebellious, sinful nature. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. Now, personally, my thought on that is, if they had been thankful for all the other trees and all the other blessings of the garden, 
And I know this was going to happen. I know they were going to sin. We understand that. God had, God had a plan of salvation already worked out. He knew what man would do. But if he had been more thankful for what he had, maybe he wouldn't have reached out for something he shouldn't have had. Let's apply. In our lives today, we have a beautiful garden. I'm talking spiritually. If you're born again, if you're saved, and you know Christ is your personal Savior, you have a beautiful garden in your heart. It is not only beautiful, but God has supplied it to be bountiful. Our contentment is in Jesus Christ in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge reside. Through the Holy Spirit of God that now lives inside of you because of Christ and the salvation that God has provided through redemption through His Son, that garden is a beautiful garden in your heart. That garden is a bountiful garden in your heart. And it's a place of fellowship with God. But let's face it, there are some times God says, all right, you're going to stay in this garden in your heart and, and I'm going to be the one that resides there. What's always amazed me. God, of course, we know is in the heaven of heavens. You know Christ is at the right hand of the Father. You know the Holy Spirit is here with us inside of our, our being. That God would choose the... You think of the universe and then think how he would choose to reside in a small human heart. To walk in his garden. But sometimes, just like Adam and Eve, we choose to go outside of what God delineates inside the boundaries of the garden. I've said this many times. When I was a child, my dad would dress me up as a two, three-year-old in a little cowboy outfit. And we had this little, this, well, big dog, a boxer. And he'd put me on the boxer, and he'd hold that boxer and hold me, and we, I'd bounce around the yard on this boxer named Ginger. He had a fence in the yard. He'd put me in the back fence, you know, so I, I wouldn't wander out to the road because there was a road in front of the house. I could have gotten killed. I could do anything in that backyard I wanted to do. I could run around. They had a little swing they started to get for me and all these little toys I could play with. I was a spoiled, rotten kid. But I had a good time and enjoyed what my parents provided for me. But when I would start to climb the fence, which I try to do, I felt a loving tap administer from his hand <laughs> to the backside. <laughs> and I'd cry. I know they would say, how can you remember that? Well, they tell me. That's what they would tell me. But my parents did it for what? They loved me. Why else did they do it? Keep me safe. Protect me. Why do you do that for your children? The same. Everything in the backyard was wonderful. It was fantastic. I had a great time. I want to share a little story with you uh, that I think is apropos with this. There was a man who was, um, let's see, he was Persian, Ali Hafed, and he owned a large farm. He had orchards. He had grain fields. He had gardens. He was a wealthy and contented man until a fellow come along, was a guest one day, and says, you know, you got all this stuff, but you don't have, people are really getting into diamonds. And so he talked him into selling the farm and going and trying, he took the rest of his life, spent all his money on everything he had to find diamonds, never found any diamonds, never had a diamond mine, and died poor and penniless, committed suicide. The man who bought the farm took his camel over to the little stream that was in this garden. As the camel was taking, drinking the water, he noticed a little shiny thing off to the side in the stream. It wound up being, can you imagine, a diamond. And it became the most magnificent diamond mine in all history. It's called the mine of Ko Golconda. Golconda. Ali Hafed, he remained at home and dug in his own garden. If he'd have got, he would have got the diamonds, right? Instead of experiencing death in a strange land. Moral of the story. The more we want from a human perspective, the less we have. Adam, and old Satan speaks up. This tree over here is good for food. It's beautiful. 
This tree over here will make you wise. This tree over here will make you as God. I said the other day, can you imagine the beauty that we have around here in Hampton Roads? It's gorgeous. We're looking at it in a fallen state. Forgive me, but with fallen eyeballs. Adam and Eve looked at a perfect garden with perfect vision, saw the beauty and the bounty of it. Satan tempted them beyond, can I say this? The back fence. They chose to go beyond what God had pro provided for safety and provision and were to reap the beauty and the bounty of the garden. And then get to walk with the God who created them. Isn't that amazing? Each of us have sinned against the Lord. We know that. Look at verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse 15. God has a provision there. They've sinned. The rest of the chapter 3 goes on about how they sin against the Lord. And God is judging Satan. He's judging Adam. He's judging Eve. And look what God says to Satan. Verse 15. And I will put enmity, or enemy, between thee and the woman. Talking to Satan, thee and the woman, Eve. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman, that's you and I. Somewhere, somebody in our seed is going to bruise the head of Satan. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan, you will bruise the, head, the heel of the one of the seed of the woman. Now, who is the seed of the woman? Jesus Christ. In the early parts of the Word of God, you, know, remember, you remember God provided coat skins for Adam and Eve? He had to kill an animal in order to do so. The animal's representation of its blood is the shed blood that pictures thousands of years later that Jesus Christ, God's precious Son, would shed His blood for our sins. Amen. Yeah, man, thank you, preacher. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is shown in Genesis 3.15. This verse is known in theological terms, the Proto-Evangelium verse. The first mention of a promise of a Redeemer, of a Savior. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, did, the seed of, did Satan hit the heel of the Son of God? Yes, he did. But God, when Christ said, it is finished, and three days later rose from the dead, what happened? Satan received a head blow. You've, you've stubbed your toe in the middle of the night, getting up in the dark, and you had to deal with that toe for the next two, three days. Which is more deadly, a heel blow or a head blow? A head blow. That's why when Jesus Christ stood there on the mountain as he's about to go back into heaven, he says these words, all authority or power, he says a power, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. The word power there literally means not just the power to be able to do it, but the authority. How did he gain the authority? Yes, he's God. We understand that. But through his sacrifice of himself on the cross of Christ, the resurrection, the glorious resurrection of himself, that the Spirit of God raised the body of Christ from the dead. And he then says as he's going back, back into heaven, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. The promise 4,000 years before in the garden, the garden of Eden was that the Messiah would come and would die and he would bruise the head of the serpent. And now he says, all authority is given unto me. All power is given unto me in the book of the Revelation. The Bible talks about how the Son of God says that the keys of death, hell, and the grave are slapped at his side. I don't know about you, I rejoice in that. My Lord is in charge. He's in control. He has won the victory over Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. Satan, yes, in the future will be defeated again. Okay, I don't know. The message kind of excites me. I don't know if it does you. Well, i got a God who is able to do all things. And I learn about that in the very beginning in a garden. All right, go with me to Matthew 26. I want you to see the second garden. 
I'm going to go a little bit faster here. I want you to see Matthew 26. What's the second Bible garden? And this is near, near the time, of course, Christ is about to be crucified. Okay? Our first thought this morning is the Savior was promised in the Garden of Eden. Our second thought this morning is the Garden of Gethsemane sheltered a praying Savior. The first point is the Savior's promise in the Garden of Eden. The second point is simply this, the Garden of Gethsemane shelters a praying Savior. Look at Matthew 26 and verse number 36 with me, if you would. This is before he goes to Calvary, right before there. Um, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane was a garden. And saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Who were the two sons of Zebedee? James and John. They're also known as the son of Bo Boanerges, or also the sons of thunder. Um, he goes on. He took those three with him into this garden. All right. He says, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Verse 37, And he took with the Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. <laughs> Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In other words, not my will, but thine be done. Verse 40, And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Now, sometimes, folks, people try to explain that away. He's trying to get out of going to Calvary. That's totally against the concept of God. You remember, he's God and man. Now, he had not sinned. You remember, his father was God the Father by the Holy Spirit implanting the seed in Mary. Okay? He's God, a very God. He's perfect. He knew this plan of redemption was planned before the Garden of Eden ever came about. From everlasting to everlasting, He is God. And He planned it in everlasting eternity in the past. That His Son would come and provide redemption for you and for me. He's not praying to get out of the physical suffering. He's praying because at that time on the cross, those three hours when the Sky turns dark from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. He was on the cross from 9 a.m., which was the beginning of the first the, the morning sacrifice in the temple. Until six o'clock in the three o'clock in the afternoon, he, he hung on that cross. Three o'clock was this, the evening sacrifice in the temple. From 12 o'clock to three o'clock, the sky went black. God the Father turned the back on his own son as he hung there with all the sins of mankind. There are almost 8 billion people on the face of the earth today, not including all the ones that lived prior. That's a lot of sin. And Jesus died hanging there with your sin and my sin upon himself. He's a praying Savior. This is the time, getting ready, to bruise the head of the serpent. He knew, he knew the proto evangelium verse. In Genesis 3.15, he wrote it. He knew what the, the skins that were the animals slain, he took the, the, the blood flowed from the animals and the skins were placed on Adam and Eve as a covering and as an atonement. Atonement means at one -ment with God. He knew all that. He wasn't praying to get out of that. The Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The father has to, not, has to turn away from all that sin that's on his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Amen. that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
God has provided that for us. Jesus entered into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And he's full of sorrow and, he, and he's poured out. Other, other passages tell us that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. When it says they're sorrowful, when it says they're, um, I'm missing my verse. Help me out here. Sorrowful and very heavy, verse 37. Don't read that over lightly. Doctors tell us that there is actually a thing where a person under such anguish of spirit can, the, the capillaries and the skin of the body can break forth and emit forth blood. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in prayer. Don't divorce the two. Could we ever compare our prayer life to his? The angels came and they strengthened him. Yes. We don't understand all that. And the great drops of blood fell to the ground. When we look at that and measure our prayer life up against the praying Savior in the, the second garden here, simply our prayers become puny in comparison. And then he prays the most difficult prayer of anybody who has ever lived. He prays, Father, not my will, but thine. You may not have prayed that prayer when you got saved, but that's what happened to you. You went your own way. Isaiah 53 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And that's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. They went their own way instead of God's way and staying in the, the backyard, if you please. And we always think we know better than God. And God says, I provided redemption for you. You can be saved. You can be born again. And when you bowed your head and trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you were literally saying, Lord, no longer my will, but thine be done. Now, as a believer, there may be something I, I don't... I don't claim to know anybody has what struggles that anybody in this room is going through or those back home. I don't. That's why I pray, Lord, please, please show me what to preach. I'm not perfect. I'm a human. Please show me what to say. You know what's in the hearts of people. You know, what, you know who's going to come on any given Sunday or Sunday night or Wednesday night. Lord, what do they need? I don't know what you're going through, but maybe you're struggling with something where you can't seemingly let go. And say, God, not my will, but thine be done. The garden was for fellowship, right? He's fellowshipping with the Father right before he goes to Calvary. Measure your prayer life up to the Son of God. I understand. He's going through a great anguish there. But there are some people that I know are going through some great anguish right now, and they need the Lord. Have we been willing to make that prayer our prayer? Not my will, but thine be done. Jump over to the book of John, our third garden, and we'll close here. Salvation is free through Christ. He's provided for us. And he died on the cross for our sins. Look at John chapter 19. Go over to John 19 with me. And we'll look at one, just a couple of verses there and we'll close. We're learning from growing with Christ in the garden. John chapter 19 and verse number 41. Number 41. This is after Jesus has been buried. And it says, now in the place, verse 41, where he was crucified, there was a garden. This is not Gethsemane. This is a garden, and in it is a sepulcher or a grave, a oh, place where they could go and bury someone. 
Anybody remember whose grave it was? Joseph of Arimathea. And who went and took, he went to Pilate, begged the body of Jesus. Pilate says, yes, go get him, take him down. And who else helped Pilate during that time? I mean, helped uh, Jesus during that time. Nicodemus. Isn't it interesting that Joseph of Arimathea, who was a leader in Israel, Nicodemus, who was a leader in Israel, were what we would call silent disciples. And this garden is going to help bring out the silent disciples. Isn't that interesting? And they go and they take the body of Jesus. Verse 42, there laid they, they, so that's, you know who the they is. We just talked about it. Joseph and Nicodemus. Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. The garden tomb is a place of the powerful Savior. In the garden in Eden, it's a promised Savior. In the garden of Gethsemane, uh, we, have, we find our prayerful Savior and gain glory and power over Satan as he went to the cross. So he gained strength from the Father. And then we come to the resurrection tomb garden. And we're going to see the powerful Savior in this garden. Verse number 1 of 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the door. Or taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John. And saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, and they came to the sepulcher. And you know the story as they go on. They go down into the sepulcher. John ran faster than Peter. John gets in there. He sees. He looks inside the doorway of the tomb. He is excited. He knows the Lord has, has risen from the dead. He goes back to run to the other disciples to tell them. Peter goes in. What does Peter see? He sees the robe. And he sees the napkin that was about the head. And it's laying there. You know what's so wonderfully? Again, don't speed read your Bible. The Bible says in another place that, that the napkin was folded. You ever go to the restaurant and you go to eat and you got that napkin, maybe a cloth napkin or so you go into a fancy restaurant? My daughter is uh, just turned 29 and we had a dad and daughter date all the years of her life for birthday. Well, her birthday was this past Thursday. Where do you want to go? Now, when they were kids, it was McDonald's. I've told you that. It was easy to pay for that, you know. Where do you want to go now? Cheesecake Factory in Virginia Beach. I'd never been there. I walked in, Eric. Columns like I think the Taj Mahal would be. I said, Laura. And it, she, I, they had told me before this is expensive. I said, Laura, this is where all your, our money's going. It's not in the cheesecake. It's going in the building. You know? She sat there, and we ate, our, we ate a meal, and she had a $25 gift card for Christmas. And she said, I want you to use this, Daddy. I said, no, I'm treating you. This is our special once-a-year thing, you know. And uh, she, no, Daddy. Her husband, Josiah, doesn't like cheesecake. I do. <laughs> and so we ate the cheesecake there together and had a wonderful time. I don't know why I told you that story, but I did. When you get done with your meal... And those cloth napkins, or maybe the paper ones, what do you normally do? You throw it on the table. But in olden time, if you were not finished with your meal, so let's say dessert later or whatever, you folded the napkin and put it back on the table. It was a symbol to your hostess or host that you were coming back to finish the meal. The napkin was laid about and folded. What a glorious picture. As you've seen him go into heaven, the angel said, so shall he come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. It was a promise of his coming back again. We have a living Savior. Powerful Savior in the garden tomb. 
And that, that stone was rolled away from the door. And death cannot and never can hold our powerful Savior. Some people don't believe in the Lord. Some people don't believe in a resurrection. I was reading about a story about a, a graveyard in England, and the guy that died had put on the tombstone that, or had inscribed, that this, will ne this grave will never open up. Never. Later on, as years went on, a little seed worked its way into the tombstone. Through that, a tree started to form. It broke up the concrete of the grave. And that tree grew right there in it. We can say all day long, there's not going to be a day of resurrection. But God has promised many times in his word of what they saw, or they didn't see when he first got out of the grave, but he was alive. And that last garden is a testimony of a living Savior. Do you know him? Is he your Savior? Salvation's free, but it costs God a great price. God had it all planned with each of those gardens. And one of these days, I hear that even in heaven, there's going to be a tree there. And the beauty of it all, the manner of the fruits on that tree to eat, it's going to be glorious. God knows how to build a garden. And he'll do it in your heart if you'll let him. Let's bow for prayer. God designed that garden. And if you allow him, he'll design a beautiful garden in your heart that will be beautiful, that will be bountiful, and you'll be able to walk and talk with him all because of what he provided at Calvary. I'm glad the Son of God prayed that prayer. I'm glad he rose from the dead. I'm glad he died on the cross. I'm glad that God prophesied it in the first garden. I'm glad it all works together for you and for me. Preacher, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm going to heaven when I die. But I sure would like to know. You're amongst people who are friends and loved ones, and we'd love to take the Bible and simply show you how to come to Christ. You're not joining this church. You're not getting baptized to come to Jesus. We do not believe that baptism saves. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse from sin. You say, Preacher, I would like to be saved. I'd like to know for sure. Maybe you're watching from back home. You can be born again. You can have the new life in Christ. You can have the garden of Christ in your heart. By simply realizing you're a sinner, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And realizing there's a payment for your sin, you sinned against Him and offended Him and broken His laws. And that payment is death physically, for the wages of sin is death, and spiritually. There's a place called hell and there's a place called heaven. But you can have Christ and have heaven. Eternally. And Christ can be yours and you'll have that resurrected Jesus. If you're not saved, come to Christ today. You have, you're amongst friends. People will help you and point you to Christ. We, had, we came to Christ the same way. Just come to Jesus today. Come unto me, all you weak and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Please stand. As they're playing the piano with heads bowed and eyes closed. Won't you come? Would you come? I'll meet you right down front. And some a man will take a man with a Bible and simply show you how to come to Christ. A lady, if you will take another, one of our ladies will take a lady and show you how to come to Jesus Christ. Christian, is all good in your garden? Is your garden weak or is it powerful? Is it beautiful? Is it bountiful? Are you producing fruit in your life? Are you walking with God in your garden? your heart you can maybe there's some things hindering maybe the garden has been left unattended and needs to be attended 
come to him today. this way folks uh, they've asked in the back if those who are serving today the food if you would slip out at this time and head back to the back okay all right appreciate those who are helping out very much a lot of food back there you don't want me to have to eat all that food okay so eat all you can enjoy yourself enjoy the fellowship time if you're visiting here today you're our guest and we're glad you're here uh, what we do, we have prayer. We're going to go through this door, double doors over here. You'll go down the back way. There's nothing but a circle hallway around this building. All the classrooms are on the side. All right, our fellowship hall is on this side. There are plenty of classrooms that have tables and chairs. They're spaced out uh, with the chairs and so forth. Usually we seat six at a table. We got four at a table, okay? Plenty of room. We want you to, if you're visiting, please stay in and enjoy it with us. And um, if you didn't get one of the gifts, the guys have a gift, too, to give to you. And so what we're going to do, um, preacher, why don't you come on up here with me? Our Caleb, right? Here's Mr. Caleb. And uh, you're still wanting that mountain, aren't you? Yeah. Yep, we're going to do our best to get it. Yes, sir. And uh, we prayed for him last week. We thought he was heading out yesterday, but he'll be heading out Wednesday to go out towards Carolina, and so you pray for them. The tent will be going down, and he's going to take his tent down there and having some great meetings to happen. They're praying, praying for revival to take place. So, preacher, would you pray for us and pray for the meal? Our eternally gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today with thankful hearts, and Father, probably not as thankful as we should be. Father, you supply each and every need. You watch over us. You love us. You wrap your arms of love around us each and every day. Your mercies are renewed each and every morning. But, Father, we pray that we might realize that, that each one of us might realize that the wonderful things that you do for us. And, Father, we pray that the power of God may fall down upon this church that revival fires will begin right here and spread throughout the land. Lord, we know your word says that you'll pour water on those who are thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Father, our nation is dry. The church is dry. God, we need your power. We need your love. We need your mercy. And Father, today, we ask you to bless each and every person who's in our midst today. We pray that each one might be, be filled with the Spirit of God. And Lord, that we might go forth doing the work that you have called us to do, that we might be the servant that you would have us to be. And Father, guide us. May we be ever mindful of the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that not lean to our own understanding, Father, there's too many ways it seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Oh, God, help us today to walk with you. If we draw nigh to you, we know you are draw nigh to us. And, Father, we're thankful for this. We're thankful, Lord, that you love us that much, that you will come closer and closer to us. But, Father, we pray for the food back there today. We thank you, Lord, for each one who brought it. 
He's one who prepared it. It was that uh, the, the, the meal that you supplied, the, the food that you supplied. And Father, may you bless it to the nursery of our bodies. And bless also of time of fellowship. And we we'll give thee all the praise and glory. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.